beautiful people. Woo! Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate that. I hope that you did pick up a copy of the book over on the table, if there's some left. If not, please go do so. We put a little post-it in there so you can write your name because Rashid will be signing the book at the end of the event. And that will take place in our Corette lobby. So after the event here, please exit the auditorium to the lobby where we will be doing a book signing. All right. I want to welcome you here to the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone people. We are not the original inhabitants of this land. Go figure. Um, but we do want to be kind and loving caretakers of this land. And remember that we are not the original people here. And that the, the relatives, ancestors, and Ramatush are still here. I also want to thank all the amazing staff that make this place run that we don't see on a daily basis, our custodials, our security, our media services. They're the backbone of this place, and I love them, and for them. That's right. Did you know Summer Stride is not just for kids? It's for adults, too. 20 hours of reading, learning, exploring, having fun gets you this tote bag. You can do a tracker, you can do bingo, you can do Beanstack Online, do any of those, take, go into any of our 28 locations, tell them you did your 20 hours, and claim your cute free tote bag with beautiful artwork by Cindy Santa Maria out of Oakland. All right, we have lots of events coming up. Summer's not over, so please check out our website for a full lineup of events. This event tonight is part of our campaign called On the Same Page, which is traditionally a bi-monthly read. Sometimes we expand that to be all of summer, as we did with this book. And it's where we encourage all of San Francisco to get together, read the same book, switches up every two months, three months. Our next book will be hitting the shelves at the end of August, and that book is called My Name is Iris by Brando Skyhorse. And Please look for that soon. But tonight's book, My Government Means to Kill Me, what do we all think? <laughs> How many of you missed your bus stop reading the book? <laughs> all right. So tonight we have Rashid Newsom and Andrew Sean Greer in conversation for you. Rashid, this is his debut novel and it was a New York Times Book Review Editor's Choice for 2022, and a finalist for the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction. He is also a writer and co-executive producer of the hit television show Bel Air, The Shy, and Narcos. Born and raised in Indianapolis, he is the oldest of three children and currently resides in Pasadena with his husband and two children. Andrew Sean Greer is the author of seven works of fiction, including the bestsellers, Less, Less is Lost, the follow-up to his Pulitzer Prize winning Less. Greer has taught at a number of universities, including Stanford and the Iowa Writers Workshop. He was a New York Public Library Coleman Center Fellow, a judge for the National Book Award, and a winner of the California Book Award and New York Public Library Young Lions Award. He lives in San Francisco and Milan and looks amazing in red. <laughs> Give a hand for Rashid Newsom and Andrew Sean Grimm. Wow. San Francisco, I'm so excited that you have chosen Rashid. I just think this is fantastic. And what a filthy, filthy, dirty, <laughs> disgusting book it is. Did you, we were just backstage, you were telling me that people were, were thinking maybe you were gonna try, your editor might have problems with it. Well, my, my first reader is always my husband. Um, he's sort of a captive audience. And so he was reading it in bed and he got to a certain part and he looked up to me and it, it, it had been a section in which one character had rimmed another. And he said to me with, with innocence in his voice, do you think the editor will let you keep the rimming? 
And I said, I'm gonna fight for it. <laughs> and of course, I had, a, I had a wonderful editor at Flatiron named Naji Nieto, and she, she never thought about taking the rimming out. The rimming, <laughs> the rimming stayed in the book. Aren't, aren't, you, aren't you glad? I mean, I also, I mean, I, 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 I think there would have been a different era 10 years ago where there would have been some struggle about that 20 years ago. But now, I, it's nice to hear that that's not a, and you have, you're all in or you're not. Yes, but I, I mean, the thing I had to do with so writing to this book, because yeah. I, I typically write in television, is there sadly is a little voice in my head from TV that says, that's too gay. Like, you'd better cut out of the scene here. And so I actively wanted to fight against that and be like, well, this is, I mean, we're dealing with a book that is by and large sexually transmitted. I mean, sex is a part of the world. It's what's going on. So I just, I didn't want to pull my punches, but that was, that was something I really had to work through to get to. I'm, well, I'm really curious about that because um, I think about it too, but I haven't worked in television. I'm, did you feel there was something liberating about the novel form that let you do that? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, for most of television, it's still, I mean, unless you're on, have, you have to be on HBO or Showtime, this is still a commercial enterprise, and it's, it's people folding laundry, and it's going across the country, and you are playing to a set of sen uh, sensibilities. I was on a show where they had a gay character uh, in the mix, in the ensemble, and I noticed that he just hadn't done anything particularly gay. <laughs> like, he was gay in theory, and so I said, what if, what if we come in on this scene and they, they, he was in the back of a bar and I said, he's, he's giving someone oral sex. Like, what if that's just, we open it up and he has to stop and get up and you carry on with the scene. And there was, an, there was protest in that writer's room about whether we should do that. And one of the writers said, but don't we want to like our hero? Whoa. No, I feel like that's petting a dog in the first scene is seeing a blowjob. <laughs> We all like that. I was, I was like, who's, you know, and we, I mean, it really, we had to call a timeout on that show. And so everybody took a long walk and we came back and there were apologies and tears, not mine, but there were tears around that. So it's, it's um, the effort to censor, I mean, what's, what's so bad about it or pervasive about it is after a while you do it to yourself. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I think there is, in, for me at least, there's a struggle when I'm writing a book with a gay protagonist, and I've only written two out of like, whatever, seven books. I, it's because I've struggled, I'm like, how do I write it and not have it be um, either an imitation of a lot of other books that I've read and loved, um, or, uh, or a, a confrontation with those books, the sort of Edmund White boys' own story books from the 80s and 90s. And how do I, if since, at least being a gay male, there's sex is sort of in, implied yeah. <laughs> by what's going on. Um, how do I get that in there? But how much do I want? Like, does, would my dad read it? My mom would totally read it. But like, <laughs> you know, I feel like I had all these, I've been like calibrating that for a long, long time. I, um, I think I approached it as this is a story being told from one gay person to another gay person on a Saturday night. And you wouldn't hold back. You just wouldn't, that, that wouldn't be true to how you would talk to someone of that group. Um, I grew I went to Catholic school my entire life. Um, and one of the priests, uh, he's a good priest, Father, Father Jeff, read this book in Indianapolis and gave me one of my favorite reviews. I was like, what did he think of the sex? <laughs> And he said it was vivid, but not pornographic. <laughs> and I almost wanted to put that on the paperback. <laughs> because, the, because here's, I mean, and, and you know, it's a, it's a distinction that, that matters to me. I think sex is actually very important. I don't think of it as a frivolous thing. Um, I think it can tell us a lot about how you view the world, how you, what you desire, what you think you deserve, what you are searching for when it comes to pleasure. And, I think it serves a point in the story. It, it seems to me an odd thing to not discuss when you're looking at the whole life of somebody. So I just, I just never wanted to sort of cut it out. Well, I mean, one thing, I mean, even um, straight authors sometimes put sex in and it's terrible, like it's terribly written. I mean, it's notoriously difficult 
um, territory because porn has has sort of gone over that territory a lot <laughs> in written form, and so you're sort of stumbling across some some less than stellar writing. Well, I'm always captivated that so many people want to write about bad sex. <laughs> like I'm I'm oh, not man. I don't really want to hear about your bad sex. I mean, like. Um, and what I, one of the things I was trying to tap into and trying to remember from my youth, and, and maybe some of you will remember this as well, what was exciting about being young and having sex and, and having new partners was the idea that every night I might learn something. That somebody would do something to me that I'd be like, what was that? What do you call that? How do you do that again? Oh, wow, yeah. I mean, right, like that, it was still so novel. Like it was, it was, it was revelatory. And I wanted that sense of sex to also be part of this young man's story. I'm, I'm going to go back to like a, the kind of first question anyone would ask you. And I guess that I've never, because we've met before, but we've not had this kind of conversation. Um, and every time that uh, we've met, uh, Rashid's been in a skirt, which is why I wore one tonight. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is kind of... Um, this is not your lived history. So why did you choose this history? I am the benefactor of this struggle. Uh, both, I mean, the, the, the two things, the two movements that made my life possible, the reason I have a husband and two kids and can work and can wear my skirt um, is because of the civil rights movement and I would so call like the ACT UP movement or the, the fight against AIDS. Like those two things happened and I grew up in a time when a lot of those people were still around and available and told you their stories. And I have spent my entire life wondering if I had been born during those movements, what would I have done? Who would I have been? Would I have had the courage I hope to have had? What would have been my role? Would I have survived? So it's, it's been something that's sort of been a story I've been living with, uh, that I've inherited for a very long time. And when I started doing research for the book, I don't want to say it was easy, but it reali I realized that I'd, I'd already spent my life watching the documentaries, talking to the people, reading the books. I was already steeped in this material. And I think you need stories that are very much firsthand, but you do get something with distance, that people who aren't as directly in a conflict can see things a little I don't want to say more clearly, but because they're not as close to it, you get another view of the um, of the experience. It was we're going to have them uh, in like 25 minutes or so. We're going to open it to questions from you all because I know you've read the book. This is not a like a bookstore event. Um, uh, but I was actually describing this to my partner Enrico, who is here. I was saying the reason the book is so successful has something to do with with the distance. Like just enough distance not to be on in feeling always in the fire with it somehow. I don't know. It's interesting because, um, well, I guess I'm curious about, you know, of course, your research about it. And then what are some of, the, who were some of the people whose stories you listen to? Well, and when it comes to the distance, the other thing I think of is if I had been living in the heat of this moment, I would have taken sides, you know? Um, one of the things I wanted to do, and this is not, the, you know, they don't put this on the back because it's not the sexy part of selling a book, but it is the architecture of a book, is I wanted a coming of age story that was a political coming of age story. I wanted Trey to be exposed to the different ways you can be political. And so in broad terms, direct action, Angie, help somebody in need directly. Then there's sort of like legislature and sort of the, the, the approved channels of power, and that's Bayard Rustin, and we're gonna go talk to the mayor, and we're gonna work that system. And then there's protest, and that's ACT UP. I think you need all three of those things, and, and he's sort of exploring all of those models and trying to figure out where he will fit. But if I had been growing up in that time, I probably would have picked one, and you sort of almost have a little contempt or tension with the others. Why aren't you out in the street? Why are you making all that noise? Why aren't you doing something that's bigger picture? And, and that then sort of skews your story. By, have, by being distant, I was able to sort of, I love all three. I see that they're in conflict. I also see why they're all useful. Yeah, I mean, I, you would have probably been on the street 
I'd like to think so. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I like to think so, but I mean, you know, it depends on what age you are when things happen. I mean, um, when I was in my early, like late teens, early 20s, and worked for the Coalition of Juvenile Justice and would go to protests for the death penalty, um, you know, getting arrested, it's, not, it's almost, it wasn't so bad a thing. I mean, you'd, you'd have the phone number on your arm on who to call, and there was often a cute boy you could have coffee with, like after this is over. <laughs> now, married with two children, it's really not a good time for me to get arrested. <laughs> we can barely get these kids to where they're supposed to be between the two, the two of us, as it is. Um, but then there are other things I can do. I mean, now as I get older, I find I can call people and kind of sometimes make things happen. Every once in a while, I can write a the check. The Rustin. Yeah, you move. Path. I mean, as yeah. your life changes, what you can do. I hope when I get old again, I can be like, I can be like, you know, Jane Fonda. I'll have time to get arrested again. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's another age. <laughs> I, um, I mean, I, 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 I am not the age of, of of Trey in this book, but I, I did, I overlap a little between your generation and his, and I have to, I'm proud to say I was on the streets. But that when you were young, that was the only thing there was possible to do. I mean, I didn't, we would talk about like the, the human, you know, human rights campaign and those sellouts and that kind of thing. And now I'm like, wow. No, all <laughs> of doing it needs great to work. happen. Yeah. Yeah, but I remember thinking that myself. I was like, I think we need both sides, and like we don't have to be friends, but we need equal numbers of people inside and outside to create this pressure. But so, I am curious. Um, I mean, I want to know who, who the who the people are that you kept in your mind who made you. You suddenly were like, this is the novel I want to. I'm gonna. I'm gonna. Take time out from being a dad no. and writing and producing television shows, and I'm going to write this book. I mean, it, was, it feels like it's you have to feel passion to write a book like oh, this. Oh yeah, I mean, it it wouldn't leave me alone, right? Like that's that's also how you know you have a book. It's like you just keep thinking about it and thinking about it. And if the only way you're going to get it out of your head is to sort of type it up, um, I I mean, when I think of like who those stories were, I mean, there were just so many things that come to mind in the sense that like. When I was in high school, Indiana, um, they brought in someone who was in the last stages of his fight against AIDS, and uh, Miss Compton, my my social my social studies teacher, asked me to interview him in front of all the other students, and that was a really seminal experience. Um, when I was in college at Georgetown, I volunteered at a place called Grandma's House, which was a group home for children who were HIV positive or are living with AIDS. And they'd all been placed together. And I mean, so that was also just seeing it through that lens. Um, I have an uncle who's 14 years older than me, so is Trey's age, and would hear those stories and, and see those people. It just it had always sort of been around me. And one of the things I had noticed, I mean, I, we, I understand why this happens. So I, again, I'm sympathetic. But in most of the stories about this time period, they were like four white guys. And I'm like, I think there were women around. And I think there were people of color around. And I just wanted to tell one where we're gonna like, we're gonna center those two people. I mean, that the story actually becomes a love story between Trey and Angie, like that's your, that he chooses her, was really important to me. Um, I'm curious, I, I I was I was starting to explain this too to Enrico that I thought I used to worry in the past ten years that because this is part of history that is not taught in most American schools or high schools of any kind that it would be forgotten and what it was like to live through it would be ignored and would be erased by history. And yet I read a book like, and certainly people have been trying to read about it, but I had a sense that young queer people, it was a sort of strange, they kind of knew about it. Are you finding that this is a book that young queer people are taking up and learning about their history? Yes, and that's been very exciting. I mean, like I can pick out, like we're at a book fair, I know my readers, you know, like <laughs> give me a non-binary person of color with piercings and dyed hair. I'm like, you read that, you ready? Um, yeah, that's been good. I mean, it's, it, what's, 
what's interesting is like, or at least for that crowd is, what is a retelling for most of us is fresh news to them. Um, when I was writing this book, I was working on a television show and we always have young people fresh out of college there and, and queer people. And I asked one of them, do you know about Larry Kramer? And they said, oh yeah, he's an AIDS activist. What else? And there was nothing else. Like, right, it's that postage stamp sort of, I know this one thing. And I'm like, Larry Kramer is a pretty big personality. You know, <laughs> I mean, you should know one or two things more about him. And they didn't. Um, same thing is true. I mean, like right now, they, they sort of like live in an app culture. They don't, what do they know about bathhouses? What do they know about what bathhouses used to be? I mean, I have a whole crusade about why I think bathhouses got a bad rap and they were wonderful. But, <laughs> um, but, it, but, but for a young crowd, it's interesting to watch them sort of walk into a world that they're like, like because no one taught them about it, it's all new. I mean, I just think that is, it's so fantastic because I, I think also I'm like, you're not old and they don't actually maybe want to hear those stories from some old guy. They want to hear it from <laughs> you. You know what I, there's something different about it because you have a, a a, a distance, you're the storyteller. You're not the participant. Yeah. You know and I, I, well, I, there's no, um, and I don't, there's no, there's no judgment coming from me. I'm not saying, oh, how did you, you should know this. How do you not know your history? I don't, I don't have Or it. you have it so good these days, you no, whippersnappers. No, no. Yeah. No, I think one of the things I respect is uh, about being young is you come into pop culture when you come into pop culture. So I was born in 1979. When I was growing up, uh, there was this white man who sang with Michael Jackson. His name was Paul McCartney. Yes, I'm I, aware of that I, song. I, I, I didn't know he'd been in another group. Paul McCartney was the cool guy who sang Say, Say, Say with Michael Jackson. If you are a seven-year-old black boy from Indiana, someone has to tell you he did a little something before that. And that's all that pop culture ever is. People are coming into the conversation where they come into the conversation. Well, I mean, that, <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful and I also think a really generous way of, of I think that's exactly why this works, that it's not um, didactic and you better know this stuff. It's not Larry Kramer writing it, you know, yeah. who would have done <laughs> a different tone, yeah. honestly. And um, Well, it's also why the book, I mean, it's why I use footnotes. Like, I'm not trying to assume you know anything. I mean, my favorite footnote in, or talk about in this book is like, I'm trying to have the characters speak as they would speak. So in the mid 80s, two people come up to each other. Did you hear Patty's new album? Depending who you are, that could be Patty Smith. That could be Patty Lapone. You two black Lepone in the 80s could be, yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and if you are two black guys, it's Patty LaBelle. Yeah, it is. And so I, if you know that, Let's keep moving. If you don't, I wanted something to just give people a handle because I don't assume everybody has their arms over all of pop culture. But that's one of the, I mean, it, it's funny for me to read it because you don't, it doesn't read like a historical novel in some way and yet it's so thoroughly researched. I mean, how did you do that to wear, wear your research so lightly and, and, and to live in it? Um, I mean, part of, part, of the, I mean, part of research for me is like, immersing yourself in it and then forgetting about it and then coming back to make sure you didn't screw anything up. So, so with a character like Dorothy Cotton, I mean, this is what's great about writing about anybody in the second half of the last century. There are so many videos, so many audio recordings. Dorothy Cotton did a three hour oral history for the Martin Luther King Museum. I listened to every word. And then there were a couple more with her. So I think it was like, maybe you do like eight or nine hours of Dorothy Cotton. Well, then you go writer. And you don't kind of go back to your notes. You see what sticks with you. And then you, and then you go check it. So I, when I was writing it, I was like, I'm pretty sure she'd been physically abused by her father. Because you're doing a lot of things, right? And so I wrote that up. And then I went and checked, OK, yes, that was true. I, that, did, that came from somewhere I remembered. So that's, that's, how I, that's how I tend to try to use it. I try not to be, you know, um, it was May 14th, it was 87 degrees that day with a gentle breeze out of the West. The Mets were playing the Cubs. And you know, you, people don't experience history in all those details. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
Uh, now I just I got I got sidetracked from what I was going to ask you. Um, right. Because I, I guess I'm, I'm curious, you know, I have writerly questions for you, which are sort of like, how was the storytelling different in the written medium from a visual medium? Um, it was, it's so freeing to be able to write a novel. Like, I feel like it's, it's, it's so exciting. I mean, television, because it ultimately is something that has to be produced and made, is, it, it's, it's like designing furniture. I mean, the, the table has to have four legs. I mean, Whenever you're watching something and people are like, this show is groundbreaking. I'm like, did it end in 48 minutes? <laughs> I mean, like, did it do everything that all the other shows, like, it, it just has, it, there's, they're just set parameters to television, um, which I like playing in, I should say. I mean, television's been very good to me. But with this, it was great to not have to worry about crowd size and production and, and, and how you were going to make all this real, right? You could just, you were playing in the theater of the mind um, and I could also take detours. I mean, there's a chapter in here that I'm like, if I were doing this a show, I would absolutely cut. Because I go, you can't do that. I mean, it's, it's, it's where Trey kind of gives news to tell someone, oh, by the way, Barney died, your ex-lover died. The main character is sitting on a couch drinking while somebody else tells their story. He is, at that point, a viewer. In television, you're like, yeah, we, we don't do that. You know, your hero Why don't you do that? Your hero is driving the action. Your hero is always, is always in charge, in the lead. So what's different? Why did you choose that in the book? Because it would happen that way? It would happen that way and because we're not, I mean, because in life, no matter who you are, every once in a while, you got to sit down, shut up, and listen. Like, you don't always, <laughs> you know, it's always amazing. These, you watch a show, the lead character is always just telling everyone what to do, and they're just, they've always got the answer, and they always come up with the idea. Like, you know, you'll watch a show where they've got a squad. No one else on the squad solves the crime. Never. 100 <laughs> episodes. No one else comes up with the key idea. It's always got to be our lead. And television is sort of like that. But when you have a book, you're allowed. People will go with you. Uh, they'll take a stroll with your character. If, if you've got them, I think, genuinely hooked. But how did you know that? It's what I like about books. Okay. I mean, like... <laughs> I'm one of my, one of my, I love uh, Kurt Vonnegut, who oh, yeah, well, that's loves a tangent, yeah. loves just taking you off over there, and he'll get back to this. We'll get back to this, I promise. And so that, that sort of, you know, I wanted a little taste of that. Oh, well, that's delightful. Because <laughs> you're trying not to, I mean, one of the things I'm trying not to do is I'm trying not to be too heavy. I mean, it's why the book starts the way it starts. I was like, okay, we're going to go, he's going to go some places you're not, you don't normally go and you haven't done. So why don't we start with, you move to a new city. Where are you going to live? Where are you going to work? Who's your friends? Where are you going to get laid? These are the hierarchy of needs <laughs> for people moving to a new city since the Stone Age. <laughs> and so that felt, hopefully the reader's reading that and remembering how they went through that experience. So by the time you get to the bathhouse, you're like, well, you've, you've been through a quarter of the book. Just keep going. I think if I had thrown you into the bathhouse right up, I think a lot of people would have said, where the hell am I? And closed the book. Really? I think you've got to walk a lot. I mean, that's a different book. I mean, and for people who love that, great. But if you want to walk more people into it, I felt like let's start with things that feel pretty universal and then just let's get more and more specific. See, because I think, but maybe I'm, I'm, that there are things that you learn from television writing that you took like the solidity of, of storyline, something as novel as we just are terrible at, you know, <laughs> editors make us do it. And then you, you took the things, the liberation that you found in books and put them together. Yeah, no, I was not, I mean, like there was no fear of where is the story going. God, and see, that's so foreign to me. <laughs> <laughs> No, I knew, I mean, that's also what's great about historical fiction. Like, you know you've got these landmarks that you're like, well, right. when I get there, I'll have a lot to do yeah, yeah. and all that. Though there was one surprise, and it just goes to show, like, that nobody knows how history is going to turn. I had spent my entire life hearing about Larry Kramer's famous speech where he sort of said, he suggested ACT UP. That, now, of course, that idea had been out for a while, and other people had suggested, you know, so, but let's, let's go with the Larry Kramer version. Larry had gave a speech and he asked these people, everyone to stand up, and he did this great famous opening. And I just assumed when I got to that, I would get the rest of the speech and put it in verbatim. And then I got there, and no one had recorded it. 
Like it's just, it was just Larry Kramer giving another speech. He did them all the time. And, <laughs> and Larry himself had notes and sort of there's a boilerplate that he would go into. And so he just didn't write it down. Like nobody in that moment knew they were listening to a speech that three days later would result in the founding of ACT UP. So it's just lost. Which then as a writer, you're like excited and you're scared because you're like, well, I guess I have to write this speech now and make this sound like Larry Kramer. Did that, was that fun to do? Fun and scary. Yeah. Because my, I mean, my fear, of course, is that you know, people from ACT UP, anybody's just going to come up and tell me how you got it wrong. Um, I'm, I can say this in San Francisco. New Yorkers love telling you about old New York and how you don't know anything about it. And so writing a book about old New York meant I, I had opened myself up to the vulnerability of people letting me know what I'd gotten wrong. Do you get a lot of people telling you what you got wrong? That was my fear. It's actually been very sweet. Um, I did an event this past March with Sarah Schulman. Yeah. Right? Like huge ACT UP a a activist. Um, and so she invited me to this reading and I'm doing the reading. And of course, other ACT UP people are going to be there. And they, they came up to me and they were, they were very lovely um, and complimentary. And I was emotionally overwhelmed. And at one point had to just go back to the green room. Because you're supposed to read. I had, this is before the reading. And I was like, well, you can't just go up there and cry. Uh, so I had to like kind of collect myself. But that was very, um, that was very gratifying. Um, they too had worried that, that's, that the story was being lost. I mean, everyone's happy that there's, there are things like prep and like they, that. This, they were, everybody's thrilled, but in that move to celebration or that move into this new era, it's almost like everybody's really happy to forget what we went through. It would be like if the whole world shut down because of a virus, <laughs> and we were like in our houses for like a year and a half, and then that ended and we pretended it never happened. That's a really interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because I, if you see an old movie like Long Time Companion, and then there's at the end, they fantasize about their cure being found and yeah. everyone celebrating. And, and like, I mean, there's total treatments now, but there was never a moment. I always thought there would be a parade. Parade. Street, parade. Yeah. But no, but also, but nothing. It just sort of, also, because I didn't realize there'd be generations moving on who hadn't live through what I lived through, and that would slowly be a different experience, and so that prep would be something would be natural to take, or and that uh, the cocktail would be something. I just didn't think about it that way. Um, a friend so of it didn't happen what I wanted, you know? No, no, a friend of mine, she's an older woman who pointed out, like, she was like, you know, younger women today don't, they can't understand the fear of what it was like before there was the pill, right? Like, but once you have, if you grow up in an era where there's the pill, that's just your reality. That's the, that's the water you swim in. Um, and so, you know, you just don't, you don't know what you don't know. Um, but I mean, what I'm hoping is, like, with a book like this, is like, this is a, hopefully an interesting way to teach history because it doesn't, hopefully it doesn't lecture and it doesn't bore you. But it, but somewhere in there, there might be learning. I mean, that is, that was an aim of mine in writing it. It seems like, Probably writing it was, but also publishing has been an emotional experience for you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I've, I'm not prepared. I'm, I'm from the Midwest. And so, you know, I, 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 I don't give over to emotion very easily. And yet I've been, like, crying in public so much since this book came out. Um, I, I think I was mentioning backstage, one of the things that happened when I, when I first went out on book tour that I was completely unprepared for, we'd go to Q&A and people would stand up and tell you, about who they lost to AIDS. They would stand up and tell you about what they did during those years. And it was, it was very heavy to deal with, but I was also like, I appreciated that people shared that. I appreciated that they could talk about that. Um, my husband once for Christmas got me the New York Times Book of the Dead. It's the obituaries, the big obituaries of the 20th century. I don't mind talking about the dead. I think it's sometimes odd that we exclude them from conversation just because they happen to be dead. And so when people came up and did that, I was all right with it. But it was, it was, um, 
it was very emotional. And it sounds like also like being embraced by these former ACT UP activists and writers and novelists and... Oh, my husband and I, we, so we live in Los Angeles, so we go to Palm Springs ever so often. It's like, it's like the birds in migration, right? The, you just, the body tells you it's time to fly. So we were in Palm Springs, and there's uh, a bookstore there, uh, Best Bookstore in Palm Springs, I believe is the name. Um, it's literally the name of it, Best Bookstore in Palm Springs. And so I was like, I was doing that thing where I just go in and sign my own copy. Because, you know, I mean, you're here. And I went in, and Peter Staley was there, just by chance, signing his book. And I freaked out. Like, not only do I admire him, but like, I mean, he's hot. I mean, like, there's a whole thing. There's, <laughs> there's just a lot of emotions happening, you know, and he's right there. And, and with my husband, he's like, you should go over there. Go over there and, you know, ask, sign his book, ask him to sign you. And, and I go over and I, I begin to introduce myself and he, he was like, oh, no. Oh, my goodness. Yes, I read this. I read this. Oh, my God, I love what you did to Larry. <laughs> and I... <laughs> And it was, I mean, yeah, it's one of those times, again, you're like, you're crying. I mean, it was, it was great. I mean, so those things kind of kept happening. Um, I'll tell you another one, because it happened here in San Francisco. I love City Lights Bookstore. Like, I mean, I go, I mean, since I was a kid, like, since I've been coming here in my, you know, went to, you know my early 20s, I almost felt like I had to buy something from there as, a, as a, like, an alms every single time I came to San Francisco. And so I come when the book has just come out in hardback, and I don't know where it is, and I'm, I think they might have it, but I'm afraid, like if they, do, like I don't want to call, because if I call and they don't have it, then I'll know that, and it's kind of nice to think they might. So one of, so one of my best friends, Alex, called, and, he's, and he, he tells me, he goes, they have your book. Oh my God. You crazy person. They have your book. Let's go <laughs> over and sign it. So I go over uh, to, to sign the stock, and there, there are three there, and I said, okay. And they said, yeah, you can sign it. And then the, books, the bookseller says, I'd better grab the one in the window. It's in the window? It's in the window of City Light? I mean, again, crying in the streets. There are a lot of things you think about when you're gonna have your book, but you just don't, I don't know, you just, your mind just doesn't go there that that's possible for you. I'd been going there since my early 20s. I never thought, I mean, I just never thought that would happen, and there it was in the window. And so that was, that was lovely. Does it feel like, in a couple of minutes, we're going to open up for questions, so get them ready, and I won't be choosing you. There will be someone else with a microphone. I mean, is there, I don't know what, what stupid question I have, except sort of like, does it feel like a shock and a surprise, or is it what you thought it would be to be like a, a successful novelist? Or oh, it's a total shock, and that's what's that's what's lovely. Like it's you know all my all my ambition and commercial uh, sort of drive is in television, right? Like I am a merciless. We need more money than that, right? Right? Like that's where I make my living. Yeah. Whereas this is a lot of fun, and um, I don't have. I, I'm much more able to say we're going to write this and we're going to let it be what it's going to be. So. I, I was surprised they put the book in hardback. I thought it would go straight to paperback and we'd just do the, the, the sort of like the queer bookstore circuit and be done with it. They sell it in Barnes and Nobles. <laughs> I didn't think they would put but it. But of course they do. I didn't think they'd put it in Barnes and I just, I, I didn't, I didn't think, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one more story about crying, right? So when your book comes out, <laughs> when, before your book comes out, they're like, we need blurbs. You need to get people to write nice things about your book. I'm a debut author. I know people in television but I don't know many authors. So I asked my friend Ayala Waldman, I go, I, would you blurb it? She goes, sure, I'll blurb it. She goes, do you want Andy to blurb it? And I was like, Andy? It's me. She's like, oh, Andrew Shanker. <laughs> I said, I've never met him, but yeah, I mean, the Pulitzer Prize winner gonna blurb my, I mean, like, what am I gonna say? No, no, who's this? yeah. So she, she says, well, he's, he, I, remember, I remember she goes, he's in Italy and he's writing something of his own, but I'll see. <laughs> and, and I never thought about it again. I have, I, I have a horrible memory, and I recommend it. The, 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 the things I let fall out of my head and don't give another thought. So she said she'd try. I didn't think about it. Um, 
I live in LA, my editor's in New York. We were getting up at, I was getting up at six in the morning to have editorial meetings with her before my children woke up and before I had to go to work. So I get up for my six o'clock meeting with her, so it's like quarter to, it's quarter to six, I'm getting my tea. And before I open the link, there's an email from you from Italy. And you wrote this incredibly lovely, thoughtful, touching intro about how, you, how, how the book made you feel. And then you gave me this blurb, which then ended up on the book. And I was, I was shattered. I was humbled. I was surprised. I never thought it would work. You didn't have to do it. It meant the world to me because in this sort of situation, when someone like you does that, it gives permission for other people to like it. One of the toughest things in art is when you make something new, people are afraid to say they like it because they're not sure that a lot of people are gonna go with them. They don't wanna be the first one. They don't wanna be out there alone. And so then when you say, well, this is good, suddenly all these other people feel safe in their opinion. And so that, that was, I mean, I didn't see that one coming either. Oh, well, gosh. <laughs> well, you inspired me to wear a skirt. I feel safe. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, that's really sweet. You know, I mean, there were authors who did that for me. Uh, you know, Michael Cunningham had never met me, and he wrote a blurb of a book of mine, and you're, there's authors you're going to do it for. Yes. You know? Um, I, I think it'd be great to hear from all of you who came here because you are in a book club together. <laughs> this woman over here is going to... Oh, here comes Ray with the microphone. So you're in television. Tell us about the possibility of an adaptation. It's, it's, a, it's a little rough. I mean, I think the day will come, but I don't know that the day is soon. Um, I'm friends with Stephen Canal, who uh, is one of the co-creators of Pose. And we were talking about this book, and I was like, well, I can't adapt this book for television. You did Pose. Pose covered the 80s, the AIDS crisis, people of color. It was through sort of like the drag queen ballroom scene, like, right? Like it, did the, it had that world going for it. Unfortunately, for most creative execs, they'd be like, we've already done that. <laughs> of course, we can have you know, dozens of cop shows, lawyer shows, all that sort of, they can all be the same, they can, you know, be interchangeable, but, and I'm, and I'm, by the way, and I'm happy there was a pose, it got critical play, a praise and awards, it did all the things that it was supposed to do, but I know enough to know it also sort of takes that space away for me, and so I was very, I think, again, it may be in 10 years or something like that, but I mean, um, you know, it was an American fiction came out and did very well recently. I mean, that book's 20 years old. So sometimes that road happens. I'd also have to think about what I wanted to do, especially if I was doing television, because as seasons passed, we kind of, they, they kind of force you to torture your heroes. And I'm not sure there are things, I, I'm, I know there are notes they'd be like, well, when is Trey going to become HIV positive? Like that would just be a notes call on a random Thursday. And I'm not sure I, I I'm not sure I could, treat the characters as, I don't want to say cavalierly, but there, you know, TV is a torture chamber. Like, no one can live in peace. Well, if not TV, would, why not, like, um, uh, live theater, drama, something Ooh. like that? I haven't become a playwright. I'd have to become a playwright, right? Like, well, you did this, sir. <laughs> Think of the liberation of the... the <laughs> I mean, like, yeah, I mean, they're, like, I like, I mean, I would love a movie, like a close, like, let's just do it. But I also know, I mean, you know, there's a, the, he, he has a bike accident, right? Do you know what it costs to dress a major street in New York City for the 80, I mean, just for the bike, that, I mean, that is a $80,000 bike scene. Just to see him hit that pot. You have such an insight into the numbers of these things. I never look. Oh yeah. I'm like that dragon is five million dollars. Oh yeah. No. No. I mean, so I've been in television for 16 years. I've been a showrunner. When you are a showrunner, they bring you the budget and you sign off on it. You are financially. You're you're saying we're going to stick 
to this budget. I've been on shows where I was on, I was on The 100, I don't remember, it was a sci-fi show, and everybody thought it was so, it, we, we, they were in outer space, right? And there were windows in the rooms, and you know, outer space should be through the window. Well, it's also rotating, meaning every time you look out the window, it should be a different view because you're circling, meaning it's a different visual effects shot every single time. Every time you looked out the window, it was $5,000. By episode four, we got rid of the windows. I think you'd be good on Price is Right. <laughs> Only if it were television. It's like, how much for these extras? I can't do eggs, but I could tell you how many 20 extras are going to be. Is it on? I'm sorry, just to make sure everyone can hear you. Some people you, are, are hard of hearing. You, are, you, are holding, you are holding a baby, correct? Yeah. Oh, okay. gosh. Yeah. All right. um, I had to come out tonight with him because I was just I love so it. moved I love by it. the book. Like, it really, I hope you, like, I hope you don't excuse my language throughout this. Oh, he's, he's fine. He doesn't understand it yet. <laughs> you know, we all grow up different ways, right? But I was wanted to like hear you talk a little bit more about the family plot because I felt like that was what was so compelling about Trey for me as a character was like thinking about the giant wounds kind of that he carried around with him and how you kind of got that idea to like have him feel so responsible for the loss of his brother because I feel that that was one of the things that like the fact that it came up so late in the novel, what it really was that he did and didn't do, like it was so compelling because it feels like everything he's doing now is like penance, you know? Right. Uh, this, thank you for that question because this, this goes to something that I don't recommend, but it's what I did. I wrote an entire novel about, um, it was a multi-generational novel about a fam, black family in Indianapolis and Trey was in the third generation of that family. I do not suggest writing an entire novel to learn the backstory of your character in another novel, but that's what I did. So that, that story and that loss of his brother had been part of another book, which failed to sell. And, and in that book, Trey goes, he leaves Indianapolis and he goes to New York just like he does in this book. So one of the things I did with this book is I was like, well, why don't I just follow this character I know a tremendous amount about to New York and see what happens. So what do you think you'll do with it now? With that book? Yes. I mean, again, like, I think maybe down the road I could resurrect it, and, but nobody's asking for it. Like, that's not... I don't know. These people might. <laughs> she seems that baby. <laughs> maybe when your baby can read, that book will be... That book will be available. Hi. Hello. I was uh, wondering that, uh, you know, on page 20, Maynard dressed in there's no evidence that he ever went to St. Morris. Yes. And then there is a couple of other, like, there is no evidence that they went to Trump or Trump denied all this. So I was wondering who wrote that down there? Because if it is all fiction, why to put that in there? Um, I wanted, I, one of the tricks I'm playing for is I thought, well, if I use footnotes, people will think it's more serious, right? <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's a, I mean, it's like when you go to a magic show, you know they're going to do illusion, and still you're like, <gasps> right? And so I knew it's going to say a novel on the front, but I'm doing everything I can to make you think all of this really happened. And sometimes, it, to my mind, when you admit that you don't have evidence on something, it gives credence to the idea of, oh, he's being straight with me. He's admitting he doesn't have evidence on this, so then I can believe everything else I'm reading. I will also tell you that the publisher's lawyers loved those footnotes. <laughs> because it just also sort of, it sort of saved us, uh, in a way, from, from any sort of liability. Um, I have a question. The, um, the contents, the, the titles for each of the chapters, they're almost like a story in themselves, like um, a sanctuary can be a sordid place. And so I 
kind of have the idea that uh, working in television, you kind of could encapsulate the idea of the chapter in that one um, heading. And so when I look at a book, I always look at the, uh, the chapters and see what they are like. And you captured my interest right away with all of your very descriptive headings for your chapters. And I have another question. Um, in, you wrote about, in the very beginning, about being a bicycle messenger, or Trey was. And it's so descriptive and so realistic. I was just wondering how you came into all of that information about what it's like to ride a bicycle in New York and to be a messenger. And it was very interesting at the end, the message was, well, we're all pawns in the chess game. And so if you could address those. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I thought of this episodically. I mean, that does come from my TV training. It also comes from the fact that I have two small children and a, a full-time job. And so if things are episodic, it became easier for me to remember where I was when I last left off. Because I'm reading this, and, and then you know, your kid gets sick, and you don't touch it for three or four days, or something happens at work, and it's been a week and a half. And it couldn't be sort of an open water novel where I was like, what, what was I doing? I was like, oh, this is the one where he gets a job. This is the one where he goes to the bathhouse. Those sort of episodic things help me as a writer step in and out of the narrative as I was going. The bike messenger one is, is interesting only that I wanted a job that I thought, what used to be pervasive that you just don't see anymore, right? What was something before PDF, before, like, I mean, they were everywhere. Um, I didn't, I, they were still around when I was in college and I was in DC. And I guess I also fixated on them because I just thought so many of them were sexy. <laughs> you know, I mean, they're just like tatted and scarred and they're on the bikes and they're, I mean, you're fit and it was, and I was 18 and I just, I was like, oh, you know, like they would look at me and I would just get the shivers. <laughs> so that, that was, it was, it was fun to bring all of that back as well. They were so cool at DuPont Circle, hanging oh, yeah. out there. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, which and, was and also it, the gay area, you know. Mm -hmm. So it was like an overlap. I, they, oh yeah, there was there was totally overlap, and it was. I mean, it's that thing when you're sort of like, you know, you see kids at the zoo, and they're like, they're like tapping the glass, and then the lion comes at them, and they're scared out of their mind, but that's what they wanted. That was also how I would explain. Like I would be like looking at them, and then they look at me, and I was like, oh, like I'm not, I'm I'm not ready yet. But I'm glad that there's something happening here. So, all right, we all have a kink. <laughs> Hello. And I just wanted to um, thank you so much for your book. It was incredibly fascinating to read. I love the footnotes. I actually went through the whole book, and I guess it does say a novel. I didn't realize it was a novel until later. I was imagining that that was you, and that all those different things had happened. Um, can you just tell me a little bit more about the voice of Bayard Rustin? Like, that was so fascinating to me. I was thinking, like, how did he remember all the different things that he said? But just the power of that connection. And I, I love the way in which you just wove so many different pieces of history throughout and made them so vibrant. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I mean, Bayard, again, left an incredible trove of interviews and uh, recordings and video that you could watch and watch and watch. And so I, I did just sort of immerse myself in that. I was incredibly afraid because uh, Walter Nagel, who was his last partner, is still alive. And uh, I was like, how is this going to go, right? I put him in a bathhouse and all this sort of stuff. I did meet Walter. And, um, and he, was, he was incredibly supportive, though we did have a moment of friction. Um, one was I'd refer to Trey or refer to Byard in the bathhouse as stooped and sort of saggy because he's older. And he posted a picture on Facebook of Byard Rustin at the beach in his 70s looking trim and fit. <laughs> so like in the paperback, I was like, we need to add a correction. Um, and then later I did an event with him and he had agreed to the event. It was at the Byard Rustin uh, Center for Social Justice, and he was really like icy with me when he came in. I was like, what is happening here? And I said, I, he was like, I thought you, essentially I was like, I thought you enjoyed the book. And he was like, that's before I finished it. Oh. I was like, okay, what, what's happening? And he says, you know, at the end you have um, Bayard suggest to Trey that he's got to cut Angie loose. And he would never have done that. 
he separated himself from the movement, but he wouldn't have suggested that for another person. And I said, I absolutely respect that. I needed my hero to break from his mentor. And I mean, let's, I mean, there was, there was no way the fictional version was going to be as good as the real man. And you should say that when we get out there. And so he did, and it all sort of, and everybody hugged. It's all good. But there was a moment where it's like, you're five, they're like doing the intros, and you're like, what? We have a problem? <laughs> but we worked through it. We worked through it. I mean, I've been talking about this as a, as, as a, a novel that's part of queer history, but it's also part of African-American history. I mean, are people reading it that way? Do you think of it that way? I think of it that way. I mean, I, I mean one of the things I think, and I, I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people who live through ACT UP, they almost have a sense that they did not succeed, right? Like they wanted to stop this disease in its tracks. And that's not what happened. But I still think of that as one of the most successful political mobilizations that's ever happened. This, this country was perfectly prepared not to give a single shit about this. And they changed that agenda. And one of the reasons I believe they did is that several people in that movement had either had, I mean, by the time you got to ACT UP, it was like their third or fourth movement. They'd been in the women's movement. They'd been in the civil rights movement. You know, they'd been in the anti, you know, um, like the Red Scare. They, I mean, like, these people had a tremendous amount of knowledge when it came to organizing and, and protesting the government. And it all sort of culminates and crystallizes in this very potent uh, movement in the mid-'80s. And that's, I wanted to make that connection, that one of the reasons why I think ACT UP is, in, you know, is was so successful is because it had learned lessons from the civil rights movement. Those aren't two separate stories. Great, I think we have time for a couple more. Thank you for writing this book. I've, I've loved it, I haven't quite finished it. But I'm wondering, as a working parent, logistically, how have you found the time to write it? Are you early morning, late at night? How do you do it? <laughs> I mean, whenever I can get it. Um, what what I reminded myself, which is also different than television. Television has a merciless schedule. Like, we do not stop. I was like, nobody's, nobody's waiting for this book. This book is going to take as long as this book takes. And, you know, if, if I had, if the other part of my life demanded my attention, that's just where it had to be. I am thrown, I mean, like, writers in the 70s, I don't think you have to go back to the 70s, you'll hear that they were like, when Papa went to his office, we knew not to make noise around that. I don't, you don't bother Papa when he's writing. My kids come into my office when I'm on a Zoom. I mean, they really, they, and I want them to, right? Like, I want them to have that sort of closeness. The writing had to take place around the rest of my life. And when I found time, I do it. And, when, and, if, and if I couldn't find time, I didn't beat myself up over it. Hi, uh, thank you so much for this novel. Um, I think the most interesting character for me was Angie, um, especially her motivations and her decision making. Uh, in your research, was there any particular figure that um, you kind of based her on or uh, any testimonials or anything? I was just so fascinated with her. Oh yeah, I, I love Angie too, I, thank you. I uh, worked in nonprofits and volunteered for a lot of nonprofits. So I, like the Coalition for Juvenile Justice, I mean like, I did things that weren't terribly cuddly. Like the Coalition for Juvenile Justice is kids who have committed crime and sometimes serious heinous crimes. But it was a question of how are we gonna adjudicate it and how are we gonna deal with it, right? So I dealt on the spectrum of nonprofits where there was a fight with average people about whether or not we should be even paying attention to the issues we were paying attention to, right? It's different than being like March of Dimes. Who's against the March of Dimes, right? <laughs> but Call of Juvenile Justice, we had, we, had, we, had, we had beef with a lot of people. And what I found is some of the most effective advocates you ever know are just people you did not want to cross. They weren't necessarily, they weren't cuddly themselves. It was hard work. They had to build a shell around themselves. They were exacting. They weren't uh, particularly uh, complimentary or nice. That uh, I worked at grandma, volunteered at grandma's house, the group home for kids who HIV and had AIDS. I remember some people. You'd make a mistake, and they'd be like, "Are you fucking stupid?" <laughs> to the volunteer, <laughs> you know. I mean, so it and it it was that it was just that kind of world. And um, for whatever reason, I adored them. Because I thought, say what you will, nobody else is coming down here to do this work. 
you know? And so I just, I, I had great admiration for people. Um, I mentioned I went to Catholic school. Jesuits used to say two things that I think of all the time. One is, do the right thing before you talk yourself out of it. And the other is, you can be good, but you don't have to be happy about it. And so there are times where I'm just like, I'm doing this because I'm supposed to do this. I don't have to be nice to you. I don't have to whistle. I don't even like you. But this is my understanding of what I'm supposed to do, and so I'm going to do it. And that's, that's Angie's sort of a mix of those two things. Okay, our final question. As I was getting to the end of the novel, um, I was sad because it was almost over, but I was also wondering, like, up until the final pages, like, how is this going to end and how is this going to be, like, satisfac like satisfying? And then it was, um, but I'm kind of curious how you decided, like, when to, to cut it and what that process was for actually ending the story. Um, it was interesting. So I went a little further, and then it was a talk with my editor. He was like, I think you stop here. And I was like, can you, are they, people going to be mad? <laughs> like, you're like, is this? Um, but what I did know in writing it, and this is, I don't know how other writers were, I don't know how, maybe you do this. I will write like 10 or 15,000 words, and then I'm like, oh, this is what the book is about. Absolutely. And yeah. then you go back, and you make it look like you knew the whole time. <laughs> um, when he had that talk with Peter, and Peter's like, what is your selfish goal? And he's like, I want to feel, like I've lived under this, guilt in this way, and I want to feel like a good person, I knew that once he saved Angie, you're done. That then he is complete. Um, and that he's, he's, I mean, what this story is, I don't want to say the whole story is prologue, but I read a bio of Joan Didion, and you got to like, you went through her childhood, her early 20s, and then somewhere around chapter nine, they said, this is where Joan Didion becomes the person you know. I believe after this book, Trey is going to go on and have a life, and this is when whoever he's going to be, he's been formed here. Like, when you meet him 10 years from now, this was his crucible. And so that, that's how I found the ending. That's a great way to end this conversation. <laughs> wait, wait, can I, can I thank you all for coming? Because... Let me tell you what it's like to be someone like me in a position like this. You spend all day with friends texting you that they're sorry they can't come. <laughs> and so by, by, by 6 o'clock, you're like, well, nobody's coming. Everybody told me they're not coming. So thank you for coming. SFPL seconds that thank you for coming. And as I said, please exit the auditorium and we'll meet you outside for the book signing. Thank you, everybody.